You know, Henry King spoke last year. Henry King had some advantages over me. Uh, he was a fellow prosecutor at Nuremberg. He, of course, was able to give firsthand accounts of Nuremberg, firsthand accounts of Justice Jackson. Uh, you're not going to get any firsthand accounts from me today. Uh, Justice Jackson died suddenly in 1954, and I was born not so suddenly in 1960. So <laughs> Chief Justice Rehnquist, who clerked for Jackson, I think in about 1951 and 52, wrote an article about uh, the justice, and he made the points I just made, and said Jackson in many ways is a lot like a Lincoln. And you know, that's, you know, that people don't, even Greg doesn't compare people to Lincoln very easily. Uh, but I, I'm gonna do that, and I'm gonna take Chief Justice Rehnquist a couple steps further. Um, so you have the obvious things, no education, self-educated, uh, country, they're both country lawyers, they both had great senses of humor, they were both terrific storytellers throughout their lives. They always had this kind of common sense and common touch that never left them, no matter how successful uh, they were. They became great writers. Um, so there, there really is something there. The two things, though, that I like the most about thinking about Lincoln versus Jackson or Lincoln and Jackson is, one, I think they both fought by writing. Uh, most people, when they write, they think first, they make some notes, then they write. I think for both of them, the act of thinking was the act of writing, and the two went together. Probably explains why they were such effective writers. Um, there's a book, if you're interested in the point I'm making, I think it's called Lincoln's Sword, which came out in the last year or two, and it makes the point that Lincoln's most effective weapon was his pen. And in doing that, it, it elaborates on the notion that every time Lincoln had to wrestle with a problem, whether it was when to give the Gettysburg Address, when to do the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, the second inaugural. He worked through these things through writing. Jackson was the same way. He, I, I've not heard of any other justice, much less a judge, that had this habit. He would write draft opinions before oral argument. Now, as a judge, I can tell you that's just extraordinary and, to my mind, stupid. The reason I think it's stupid is you don't know that you're going to be assigned the case. Uh, there are nine justices on the Supreme Court, and why in the world you'd write an opinion before argument when you might not get the case assignment is really hard for me to fathom, except if that's the way you think. And uh, that clearly was part of Jackson's way. The other comparison that intrigues me is obviously Lincoln and Jackson had this. They did have this natural talent, Springfield, uh, Warren, whatever it was, the water. Um, and they also had ambition. I mean, you have to be ambitious to do what they did. But most people with talent and ambition that succeed, they follow the matting crowd. So they do what those above them do, and once they get there, they continue to be fairly conventional. Um, not true with Lincoln and Jackson. Uh, they remained individuals throughout. That kind of country lawyer, common sense, common touch never eluded them. And uh, you know, that's, that's extraordinary. And I, I guess it proves that they were both loyal to their roots, and they never forgot where they came from. For Jackson, the best illustration of that is his opinion in the steel seizures case. That's the case in which um, Harry Truman tried to uh, seize the steel mills to preempt a union strike during the Korean War. And uh, Jackson was not assigned the opinion. As you now know, he already had written one. But uh, he was not assigned the opinion. The opinion went to Justice Black. And Justice Jackson, the individual that he was, still felt a need to write separately why he was concurring. He was still agreeing with Justice Black. And um, that opinion, the concurrence, has become the model for all Supreme Court opinions and all debates about what kind of executive branch power a president has and what kind of power he does not have. Well, how do you describe the... Everyone who gets in the Supreme Court is fairly smart. Uh, some would say very smart. Um, and once they're there, they're writing for history. So they're all trying to write Jackson-like opinions. Why does Jackson write them but the others don't? And uh, I think it's, it's the country lawyer in him. I, I, that to me, it's the, it was the common sense, the common touch, the pragmatism that was not doctrinaire. It was not about the Washington rules. Um, he, learned how to, he learned how to survive and thrive in Washington, that's for sure. But he didn't lose that. And uh, that's, that's his legacy, which is, is exciting. Inclusion. Agatha Christie, uh, I'm told, was married to an archaeologist. And she liked to say she loved being married to an archaeologist because the older she got, the more interested in her her spouse became. <laughs> so 
Justice, Justice Jackson is our Agatha Christie. The older he gets, the more interested in him we become. And so why is, why is that? A um, couple reasons. Uh, well, Warren County, it's quite natural. It's never going to stop. But that's not, it's not just Warren County. It's among the bar. Um, even before I knew Justice Jackson was from Warren County, I knew about his opinions and knew how well done they were and had a high regard for him. So what, what uh, exactly is going on there? Some of it is that he was fortunate. He was a justice during this transformative period that was just so critical in Supreme Court history. He was there when they were deciding some just critical, critical cases for establishing the role of the court in American history. And then he had the good fortune either of writing the majority opinions in those cases or concurrences. And then you add to it that he wrote like no other. And I think that really helps to explain the legacy. The other point is at the court, there's really one debate when it comes to constitutional cases. And that debate is always conflicts between liberty, order, the individual versus government. And in Supreme Court history, you get justices that incline one side or the other. And what was so terrific about Jackson, and I think reflected his roots and reflected this common touch, pragmatic approach to law, was that he never always ended up on one side. He was, he, he, you know, one day he would be with the government, the next day he wouldn't. And so I think he was always very good and very effective at trying to figure out that exact balance between liberty and order, the government and the individual. And uh, so I think, and I think that's not, that's why he's well known today, that's why he's revered today, but I think that's why 50 years from now um, that will still be, still be true. The, uh, he said once that um, about Washington, which I don't know that he ever cared for, um, I think he loved it while he was having such tremendous success as general counsel of the IRS head of the antitrust division, head of the tax division, attorney general, solicitor general. I mean, that had to be pretty exciting, just one step up after the other, and then finally being a justice. But by the time I think he was a justice, I think he saw a side of Washington that was a little less flattering, perhaps shown by the, the Nuremberg um, black experience. Uh, he said once that uh, Washington, uh, for a public official, uh, Washington takes everything and gives nothing. Well, I think what he would say about Warren County, it, it was that it gave everything and it asked nothing in return. I really enjoyed being back in Warren, being able to see my family and see all of you in this wonderful, uh, very impressive courtroom. Thank you.